as we consider humankind's many, many millennia of travel across first the old world and then their movements into the new world, what we recognize is that the ingenuity of people over this vast sweep of time and their capability to adapt themselves to environments ranging across a broad scale of climate types, vegetational types, and the way in which then people fit into these different ecosystems, as it were, or ecological niches. The human groups that came into the New World some 15 to 20 millennia ago were nomadic in their life ways. In other words, they constantly were moving throughout the year. They were following the game herds of animals that they hunted, and they were following the changing seasons to gather the various wild plants and so on that were part of their dietary system. We then recognize in the New World that probably eight to 9,000 years ago, some really intriguing experiments began to happen in the Central Valley of Mexico, far to the south, where certain wild plants that had attracted the attention of the humans became favorable to those humans for their diets. As experiments with wild crops uh, expanded far south of us in Mexico, gradually seeds come into North America through human migrations and exchanges that come to be the basis for the gardens that were planted first in the large villages along the Mississippi River drainage. And ultimately, people from those large communities, communities like Cahokia that boasted somewhere up to 50,000 people, due to the urban sprawl and the excessive use of resources, people gradually drifted away from those villages and established new villages on new river drainage systems. And you have sort of a leapfrogging effect of people moving from those areas around present-day St. Louis, from river system to river system to river system, which brings us into the James River Valley. About a thousand years ago, at the time that the Mitchell prehistoric Indian village was occupied by peoples, numbers of groups had drifted from areas east of here, bringing with them knowledge of plants, the seeds for the plants themselves, and in a life way that was a much more settled life way than those life ways that had previously been practiced out here in the plains of North America. The peoples in building these villages, like Mitchell, create a living system that supports several hundred people in a village that has, in the case of Mitchell, up to about 80 of the earth lodges. What we then find archaeologically in a village like this, when we look back at it, are the depressions from the earth lodges, in other words, the across the landscape, the places where the earth shows us that there's a, an area that has had a house standing on it previously that has disintegrated. And through the techniques of archaeology, we began to be able to probe these moments in the past that create for us truly a window on the human living systems of the past. And that is what your visit to the Mitchell site is meant to give you, the insight into what archaeology as a field of study is able to do to reconstruct these moments in time of the past. Archaeology is really a myriad of small pieces of material that are the leavings of past peoples, the throwaway parts of past peoples' living areas, which by very carefully, very concisely putting these pieces in a context, you begin to understand various parts of the site were used for cooking activities, for butchering activities, for making ceramic pots, there were sleeping areas. So you, you begin to create and reconstruct in the mind's eye that which was once a very vital village of people who celebrated life and their relationship to the environment they had in this village there's tremendous evidence for the fact that the people not only had agricultural activities in gardens that were planted along Firesteel Creek, which today is under Lake Mitchell, and with the garden products of corn, squash, beans, tobacco, amaranthus, and a number of other crops, there were a whole host of wild plants, berries, 
that were still collected. They fished, they collected freshwater clams, they took uh, wildlife in the form of birds, a whole range of small mammals, as well as hunted extensively bison. Bison is very well represented in this site. And another thing that we know about the village for certain is that it was a village that was alive with not only the activity of the people, but alive with the activity of probably several hundred dogs at any moment in time. So these villages were really vital centers on the landscape. They were communities spread up and down the river system. In other words, Mitchell and this site was not the only site here on the creek right off of the James River. There were very closely uh, aligned neighbors who, again, were practicing the same kind of life ways and who were utilizing the same resources. Uh, what eventually causes these villages to become abandoned really isn't some form of warfare or aggressive activities as previously has been believed, but in fact, the villagers eventually ran out of some of the major resources, and in this case, probably the single most important resource that they would have been depleting and would not have been replenishing itself would have been the timber. In other words, the trees that grew along the drainage systems here in the creek and river drainage uh, bottoms were something that tremendous quantities of were used in any one of these single villages. When you walk through the lodge today, that's the reconstruction, realize the tremendous amount of timber that it takes to construct a single lodge. And think about the fact that they would have had fires that they would have been building for cooking their food, for firing their pottery and so forth, along with the fact that you didn't have one lodge in a setting like this. We had up to 80 lodges at this village. So ultimately, the large timber that was needed to construct these lodges would have been timbered out. And because of the fact that there were adjoining villages doing the same thing, ultimately the people just drifted further to the west, next establishing themselves along the drainage system of the Missouri River. And ultimately, when Europeans first come into contact with the native peoples several hundred years ago in the Missouri River Valley, they're really contacting the people that were the direct relatives of those that lived here at Mitchell. The archaeological record suggests to us that the people that settled in this village were probably what today are the modern people known as the Mandan, a farming people who farmed, kept their gardens along with still gathering wild plants and hunting a whole range of wild animals and fishing. Perhaps the most exciting aspect of the Mitchell site for both we, the archaeologists, and the public is the fact that we were able to develop this wonderful research center, the Archaeodome, as part of the site, which allows us, as archaeologists, to work year-round, both on the archaeological excavations as well as processing the artifacts and engage you, the public, in helping us do that. Um, we have begun this large block excavation, which eventually will take us across the entire floor surface. The deposits here that are cultural deposits, that are part of what were left by the people a thousand years ago as they moved on to establish their new villages further to the west, represent about 12 continuous feet below where we are right now. So the amount of artifactual material is quite phenomenal. We um, in just establishing the columns for this building took out well over a million and a half artifacts. So, and you can see that even in a very shallow beginning level here, we already have a series of what we as archaeologists call features, which include the teeth and lower jaw of bison, a whole series of firecrack rock, shell, bits of pottery, all of which tell us that we have a scatter here of some sort of what we would call a midden or a trash area. Now, critical to understanding this and getting a sense of what the people were doing a thousand years ago here is the very detailed recording of where each and every piece is before that piece is removed because it's the relationship both across the horizontal surfaces and also down that give us the time factor. In other words, as you go further down in the site, 
you're looking at material that is earlier and earlier or older and older. As we move from the excavation floor into the laboratory, the next stage of preparation is to wash each of the artifacts that have been removed from the excavation units, sort them into the category of materials, and then begin a much more detailed study of what each piece represents as far as whether it's a piece of food bone like this would represent, or an actual shaped piece of stone, uh, firecrack rock, ceramic material, in other words, the pottery from the site, or some of the other material that we find, as well as the very fine microscopic remains that are contained in the soil itself, which then become studied uh, to recover information about the plants that were present through plant pollen, through carbonized seeds, and um, other botanical remains. Ultimately, as you reflect upon your visit to the Mitchell Prehistoric Indian Village here in Mitchell, South Dakota, there are many different uh, messages that one might take away from this type of a visit. Uh, certainly, the intrigue with what archaeology as a science is able to bring to us in informing us about peoples of the past, and certainly the excitement of working on a major jigsaw puzzle, each piece that you recover, realizing that that fills in, in some way, a little bit more of the total detail about the day-to-day -day lives of these people that were here a thousand years ago. But beyond all of that, one should also recognize that the archaeological record, not just here at Mitchell, but throughout the world, informs us on the, the lives the trials, the tribulations, the successes, the failures of all human groups as they move through time and space. And many of those messages are messages which are just as important to our circumstance in today's world as they were to the people that were living in these villages a millennia ago. Hopefully, a lasting legacy that emerges from the research that is conducted at sites like the Mitchell Prehistoric Indian Village is a legacy that informs us about the fragile environment, fragile ecologies that existed not only in the past, but exist today as well. And the story that certainly we are able to begin to tell is one of how peoples adapting themselves to these changing landscapes, changing food bases, and changing climates we're able to get along uh, so remarkably well. The messages that these sites convey, I think, are extremely important as we bring the past into the present. I'm Dr. Adrian Hannes from Augustana College. Thank you very much.